good morning everyone welcome to master class isc master class uh, yet once again uh, all of you are aware that this is the third uh, session of master class in the first session in 2020 we had a 20 32 wonderful lectures on different topics in gastroenterology and hepatology and uh, and and last year in 2021 we had a 12 uh, sessions on the clinical case discussion and they all went very well then we thought that uh, uh, in the next session of master class we should uh, focus on gi pathology and gi radiology so we are at uh, uh, session three of our master class and uh, uh, two weeks back uh, we had a one talk uh, on how to interpret liver biopsies and this talk was given by dr siddhartha gupta i'm sure that all of you uh, had enjoyed that lecture at least i learned a lot in, uh, in that lecture is a fantastic exposition of uh, understanding, understanding liver biopsy. If you have not uh, attended his, that lecture last uh, two weeks back, then, then Nisa from ISD Secretariat had already uploaded uh, the video or recording of that lecture on ISG website, uh, and it is seen through YouTube. So all those who have attended last lecture, please do revisit. And those who have missed out, they must listen to that lecture. And the way he, he, he describes what is interface, interface hepatitis, what is uh, bridging fibrosis, which, has, which are very clearly described in last lecture. So I think uh, it's worth going to that lecture time and again to understand how to interpret a biopsy. Now moving further, so now we'll have a lecture, lectures on uh, the biopsies interpretation of a small intestine, what is a normal intestinal biopsies, mucosal biopsies, and what is a uh, Abnormal. What is what are abnormality and how to make a diagnosis of small intestinal disorders? And next week we will have a talk on. Uh, next week, next week we will have a talk on large intestinal biopsies uh, by Dr. Anapoli Mood. To so come into today's talk, and today's talk is on how to interpret small intestinal liver biopsies, and this is to be del delivered by uh, Dr. Prasenjit Das, is my, my dear colleague at uh, Ames, New Delhi, and he's associate professor, very astute. Uh, very hardworking and very sincere, uh, I would say, uh, colleague and pathologist, and and I see a fantastic teacher. So we we'll learn from him how to interpret uh, uh, small intestinal biopsies. And to moderate the sessions, we have a uh, two very senior people, uh, Dr. B. S. Ramakrishna. I think all of us know Dr. B. S. Ramakrishna. Dr. B. S. Ramakrishna is uh, a director of uh, Department of Gastroenterology at uh, SRM Institute of Medical Sciences in Chennai. And uh, he had been at uh, CMC Valor, both as a head of the department and as a professor of gastroenterology at CMC Valor. Uh, and uh, you know, his work is, uh, is uh, uh, so fantastic in, uh, in inflammatory bowel disease and probiotics and, and so many other areas. Uh, other moderator is uh, again, Dr. Saroj Kansina, my dear colleague. And, uh, and uh, he's a professor of gastroenterology at uh, PGI Chandigarh, again, a great teacher, I would say. So Dr. Ramakrishna and Dr. Sohoth Kansina will take you through this lecture and Dr. Sanjay Das will, will explain the small and large biopsies. Before I hand over to Dr. Ramakrishna and Dr. Dr. Sina, uh, please remember that uh, you write your questions on chat box. Uh, this is more of an interactive uh, uh, session and we, we wish that uh, whatever doubt or whatever question you have, uh, please do write in the chat box and we try to I try to try to uh, try to uh, uh, discuss those points uh, and and see that uh, uh, your queries are resolved. With that, I hand over to Dr. Uh, Dr. Ramakrishna and Dr. Saroj Kansina. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to uh, be in on this. We had a sneak preview of Dr. Prasenjit's slides, and he is going to take you through a great journey in terms of how to take biopsies, how to handle biopsies, and how to interpret biopsies. Now, one of the things with intestinal biopsy, just as in liver biopsy, is that I think all gastroenterologists should be conversant with the terms. They should be able to, uh, even if they are not able to read biopsies, they should be able to read the descriptive part which is given by the pathologist. Because it's not the histology alone that is diagnostic in many patients. It's, it's the histology along with 
uh, clinical symptoms and a variety of lab investigations, which is important. And something which those of us who are fortunate to work in institutions, we've had great pathologists who specialized in, in uh, uh, gut pathology. But now that I'm in a corporate setup, I can see that you know, not everybody, the standards of reporting are not uniform. And uh, Govin and Prasenjit and the ISG have uh, taken great steps to try and standardize this. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and ask Dr. Saroj to uh, say a few words. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks, Dr. Govind and ISG for uh, giving me the opportunity to be part of uh, this program. So without delaying further, I will uh, go further for the um, start of program. Dr. Prasanjit is a senior faculty member at All India Institute of Delhi. And uh, obviously, he has uh, a special interest in uh, GI pathology. And he has also published a book on surgical pathology of uh, GI system. Uh, uh, published by Springer. So obviously he is uh, the authority in, in the field and we are going to listen to him and uh, try to understand the nitty and gritty of uh, nitty gritty of the GI pathology. So I will request Dr. Prasanjit to start. The, as the talk goes, we have some, uh, some questions on which we will have poll. So that will help us involve the audience and we'll have a small break in between, uh, something around between 30, 40 minutes time, a small break. We will discuss, uh, take up some questions and then we will proceed further. So Dr. Prasenjit, please. And this is break for not for tea. I mean, you can have a tea in- no Break doubt, for question. We'll continue with this, yes. Discussion. Yes. So a uh, very good morning, everyone. And thank you, Professor Sinha and Professor Ramakrishna for those nice introduction and Professor Makharia for giving uh, me this opportunity. And uh, I will first share my screen. So today's topic is understanding of the normal and abnormal small intestinal biopsies. And uh, as I can see, uh, there are many gastroenterologists, budding gastroenterologists, as well as pathologists who are attending this session. So it will be very basic and uh, we'll try to make it uh, more interactive. And anytime you feel you can ask me any question, we'll discuss that and we'll go ahead. So these will be my agendas today. What is the basics of small intestinal biopsy sampling? Uh, this is basically a primer for pathologists, only one or two slides for the pathologists, because many of them uh, don't get exposure to the endoscopies, its types, and how the biopsies are taken. Then we'll go into the proper uh, small intestinal biopsy, how many bi biopsies should be taken, and what are the different sites from where the biopsy should be sampled, uh, how to handle a mucosal biopsy after uh, they are sampled, how to orient them, and then histological interpretation of each and every parameters, what is of importance, then histological findings in small intestinal uh, bowel pathologies, various pathologies will go through. And we'll discuss some about the histological grading system, what is their importance and how they are done. And then reporting of the small intestinal biopsies, then we'll summarize and take up further questions. So the first thing is, this is a endoscopic instrument what is very commonly used by all the gastroenterologists to uh, uh, work with the small intestinal biopsies. And um, this is this comprises of a video processor. This is a light source. This is the endoscopic hanger. And this is a forward viewing endoscope. And uh, this is the hanger. And this is the insertion port. And this is the forward viewing endoscope. What you can see, it looks like this. This is the tip of the endoscope. and if you look at it, there is a light source, there is a lens, there is a water and air channel, and also there are water jet channels and there are instrument channels. Through this instrument channel, they pass the endoscopic biopsy, and this is how the biopsy forceps look like. It has two cups like this. The cups can vary 
uh, based on uh, the need of the biopsy. If uh, this is the standard cups where we get two to three millimeter of, uh, size mucosal biopsy fragments, there can be pelican biopsy uh, forceps where at least four to five biopsy fragments can be sampled at a time. And there can be jumbo biopsy forceps where the cups are more larger in size and we get a chunk of mucosa as well as submucosa. So this is about forward viewing endoscope. And this is a side viewing endoscope. This is mainly used for ERCP in the ampulla. Uh, there is an elevator in addition to all the components what we have already discussed. There are some other type of endoscopes like radial eco endoscope. Here instrumentation is not possible, but it gives an excellent uh, uh, view panoramic view of the mucosa and uh, all other intestinal wall structures and their pathologies. Now, if we want to see the small intestine, the proximal part of the small intestine, we can use esophago uh, gastroduodenoscope or the gastroscopes. Commonly, uh, up to the second part of the duodenum is visualized very well. However, if in an expert hands, we can also visualize the distal most part of the duodenum as well as the proximal most part of the jejunum. On the other hand, while a flexible colonoscope is being used along with the whole colon, the some distal part or a few centimeters of the distal ileum can also be visualized and the biopsy can be taken. The rest of the small intestine is usually not uh, sampled or visualized by these instruments. And for that, you have to uh, the, the gastroenterologists usually do a push enteroscopy and uh, the instrument is called the spiral enteroscope. This is a fluoroscopic view of a spiral enteroscope, which can uh, be passed all through the intestine all along the uh, length and the bio, it can be visualized and biopsy can be taken. Uh, also, balloon assistant enteroscopy can be done to uh, do this, uh, to see the whole part of the small intestine, that is called deep enteroscopy. There are various variants available. Also, video capsule endoscopy can be used. Uh, the only thing is instrumentation and sampling is not possible, but it gives an excellent view uh, of the whole small intestine as well as large intestine. And this is uh, endoscopic ultrasound biopsy needle. I have shown you uh, for the side view endoscope already. This can be passed through it and FNA and uh, FNA B needles can be passed. These though are more commonly used for the pancreatobiliary tract, but any small mucosal or submucosal lesions can be sampled also with this instrument. So this is the basic of how the endoscopy are being done and how we get the samples in our lab. So to go into further detail, we have our four first four questions. The question is, what is the range of optical magnification achieved with a magnifying endoscope? The options are up to 10 times, B is up to 30 times, C is up to 100 times, and D is up to 150 times. It is about magnifying endoscope. Anil, can you show the poll, please? Anil? Okay. The uh, Thirty-seven percent vote is for uh, option C, up to hundred times, and it is followed by option B and the other options. So we'll go to see the actual answer. So the answer is answer is the uh, correct answer is D. Optical magnification of a standard endoscope is up to thirty to thirty-five times. An optical magnification of a magnifying endoscope is up to 150 times. So the correct answer for this question would be D. So with that, we'll go into uh, the procedure of the endoscopic biopsy sampling. And we are now going into the poll question two. How many mucosal biopsy fragments should be sampled from the small intestine for optimal interpretation? Option A is one biopsy fragment from D2 and D3. 
B is four biopsy fragments from D2, D3. Option C is five to six biopsy fragments from D2, D3. And option D is five to six biopsy fragments, at least four biopsy fragments from D2, D3, and one biopsy fragment from the duodenal bulb. We shall wait for the answers. That's excellent. Uh, almost 70 to 80% of the participants are interacting with us. That is very good. And uh, the correct answer uh, they have given is option D. And that is uh, absolutely correct. We'll go through why it is important to take four biopsy fragments from D2, D3 and one biopsy fragment from duodenal bulb. So we have to remember that most enteropathies of the small bubble, what we commonly encounter are usually patchy. Uh, may it be celiac disease, may it be tropical sprue or microscopic. Uh, Anil, can you stop sharing this? Yeah, you stop sharing. They're very patchy. And that is the most important reason why uh, we should take multiple biopsies from different sites. And it has been seen in various studies that Mucosal pathologies in the small intestine is also evolves over time. That means if you have a suspicion suspected of having celiac disease and you have taken a biopsy, maybe one to two fragments from D2 only, uh, the pathologist have reported it is absolutely normal. The patient, the diagnosis, the diagnosis cannot be ruled out uh, completely. Uh, uh, completely and you have to you may have to follow up the patient do the serology again and take a repeat biopsy from the other sites more number of biopsies and it has been seen that in five to th up to 13 percent of the cases mucosal pathologies are usually missed if you sample from only one site now we'll come to the question how many biopsy samples should be taken we have said that correct answer is five to bi six biopsy fragments why it is so it has been seen in various studies, including one study we just completed now. We have seen that the diagnostic yield of four biopsy fragments is almost about 100%. Diagnostic yield of three biopsy fragment protocol is about 95%. And diagnostic yield of two biopsy protocol is about 90%. The diagnostic yield means the identification of the pathological change, the diagnosis, uh, the histological diagnosis cannot say it is tropical sprue or celiac disease always. I will discuss the, all those. So the diagnosis of pathological changes of enteropathy we are talking about, and it has been seen that as you increase the number of biopsy fragments from different sites, the accuracy of identifying the pathological changes reaches to almost 100%. So site of biopsies, it is recommended you have to take four biopsies from duodenum, uh, the second part of the duodenum, post ampullary part, and at least one to two fragments from the duodenal bulb. At least one fragment, if you include from the duodenal bulb, that increases the diagnostic yield of enteropathy up to 10%. And it has been seen, especially in celiac disease, the duodenal bulb can be the primary site of involvement, pathological involvement in up to 10% cases, and it is more common in children. That's why we should, along with other fragments which are sampled, at least one fragment should always be sampled from the duodenal bulb. When to sample from the D3, distal most part of the duodenum as well as jejunum, is there is a requirement it has been seen that distal do most part of the duodenum or D3 or the jejunum can be the primary site of enteropathy. Primary site of enteropathy means the other biopsy fragments are showing normal pathological changes and it can be seen in about one to 2% of cases, especially in case of celiac disease. So if you have a strong clinical suspicion and the serology is still high, but the other biopsy fragments are showing normal pathological changes, you may choose to repeat your biopsy fragments from the distal most part of the duodenum as well as jejunum that may yield the pathological changes.
and i need not to say what are the endoscopic features all of you know very well this is the normal duodenal fold and um, in uh, celiac disease and many enteropathies there will be some attenuation of the folds and there will be uh, uh, some mosaic pattern but it is recommended in various studies uh, uh, which which uh, 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 studied the protocol biopsy protocols they have said that even if you don't see any significant endoscopic pathological changes you have to take a biopsy from the normal looking part of the mucosa also because there also we can see increased ielts or some other findings that's why the biopsy should be taken both from the um, endoscopically abnormal area as well as endoscopically normal areas. Hence, the correct answer of our poll question 2 is at least 5 to 6 biopsy fragments should be sampled. At least 4 biopsy fragments should be sampled from the duodenum, second part of the duodenum, post ampullary part, and at least one biopsy fragment should be taken from the duodenal bulb. Now, you may ask me where from the duodenal bulb the samples should be taken. It has been seen in many studies that uh, if you can sample one fragment from any site of the duodenal bulb, that increases the diagnostic yield by about 10%. So it doesn't matter where from in the bulb you are taking the biopsy. But there are some studies who have shown that if you take the biopsies from 9 and 12 o'clock position of the duodenal bulb, that gives a very good yield. Now, after taking the biopsy, the most important point comes is about the biopsy orientation. And I urge all the attendees that you must understand what is the biopsy orientation and how it is done. Please remember that if uh, uh, this is how the biopsies are taken, this is the endoscopic biopsy cups, and the biopsies are usually sampled or collected from the cups by the tip of a needle very gently, and that is put on a filter paper. This is Watman type 1 filter paper that is very commonly available all over the hospital wards. And you can put the biopsy fragment in such a way that the mucosa is that looks up and the submucosa goes down towards the um, filter paper. And uh, after you, we have to wait for 10 to 20 seconds so that the plasma, what is present in the submucosa, that coagulates and that adheres the biopsy there. And after that, we have to put the biopsy fragment along with the filter paper in 10% buffered formalin. And always remember the fixation time and what formalin we are using, that is very important. And we need to fix it for four to six hours and send to the pathology lab as soon as possible. Now, it is very important to understand why we need the biopsy fragments mounted on filter paper. It has been seen that if the biopsies are not mounted, mounted means we are uh, letting the pathologist and technicians know in a particular way how the biopsies have been uh, positioned on the filter paper so that they can uh, follow the part, uh, a particular protocol and orient them further while uh, the blocks are being made. I will show you how they are being made. And it has been seen that if you don't put them or mount them on filter paper, the interpretability varies uh, up to 10 to 54%. That means half of the biopsies after all these invasive procedures, the biopsy may not be interpretable because they are not at all oriented. So half of the biopsies, there is a chance that there you don't get any uh, uh, meaningful pathology reports. And it is also important that post fixation, because when the biopsy is fresh, you can see the shiny mucosa, but post fixation, the mucosa becomes very contracted. Uh, the whole fragment becomes very tan brown and pathologists and technicians cannot identify actually which is submucosa and which part is mucosa. But with experience, we know that when the biopsy is fixed, uh, as the muscle, some muscle fibers are there in the submucosa, this is the muscularis mucosis, some fibers, when there is contraction due to formalin fixation, there is always a convexity towards the mucosal surface and a concavity to the submucosal surface. But uh, this, this uh, understanding this needs uh, experience and good technical hands and many times uh, proper orientation of the unmounted biopsy are not uh, achieved and we don't get a meaningful pathology reports. So we have a video how this procedure is actually done. Uh, I think there is some problem why you cannot play the video.
Yes. Okay, I have to escape the screen. Now you can see. So with a biopsy needle, it is being sampled very gently from the biopsy cups. And it is very important to be gentle here because if we become too harsh and uh, manipulate the biopsy fragment harshly, what happens? The mucosa is sloughed out and we get denuded biopsy on pathological or microscopic examination. And also harsh uh, sample, uh, handling of the biopsy with the needles uh, pr produce an artifact. It uh, Under microscope, it looks like a extensive edematous artifact and which also hampers our interpretation. That's why it is uh, very important not to uh, handle the biopsy fragments very harshly and be very gentle with them. So before we go to ideal fixative and duration of fixation, how is the duration and uh, fixatives are important? This is a poll question three for you. What is the ideal fixative for the small mucosal biopsies and what should be the duration of ideal fixation? The options are A, 40% formalin and you will fix for 12 hours and keep that in the endoscopy room. B is 10% neutral buffered formalin and fixation time for six hours. C, 40% formalin, fixation time for six hours. And option D is 10% neutral buffered formalin and you will fix for 24 hours before sending it to pathology labs. So you'll we'll wait for the answers. So that's very nice. Uh, all of you have said that we should use 10% neutral buffered formalin and the ideal fixation time should be six hours. So we'll discuss about this. The ideal fixative is actually the neutral buffered formalin, 10% neutral buffered formalin because the problem is if we use 40% formalin, which is commonly available in the uh, market or in a commercialized form, that will char the tissue and the architecture will be completely distorted. That's why you should ask the pathology lab to give 10% neutral buffered formalin. And also please remember with time, the formalin, uh, uh, the chemical property of the formalin, it also decreases gradually because it evaporates. So that's why we use sodium dihydrogen phosphate and sodium hydrogen diphosphate to buffer the formalin and it stabilizes the formalin into the solution. That's why the formalin um, remains stable for a few days. So that's why uh, you also remember that if you have formalin which is lying in the endoscopy room for about six months, you should not use that and you should always ask for a fresh vial from the pathology lab. And how much formalin or fixative should be used? You see, if this is the container, uh, please remember that your biopsy fragment should be completely submerged. And it is always ideal that you use at least 10 times of volume of the solution uh, 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 in comparison to the volume of the tissue. Ideal volume uh, uh, of the solution to tissue volume is about 10 is to 1 to 25 is to 1. But 10 is to 1 is gives a good result. And the ideal pH of the fixative should be always checked and it should be around 6 to 7.4. Because you should, we should remember that if the pH is very low, it gives a, um, a yellowish pigment, pigmentation or yellowish color uh, on the tissue under microscope, which also hampers the IL counting. That's why pH is also very important. And always you should talk to the technician and take fresh vial from the pathology lab. And fixation time five to six hours we have already mentioned because why it is so because if we fix it for more than six hours the tissue become more harder, it is difficult to cut it becomes also brittle and it has been seen that uh, if you fix it for more than 16 hours 
the antigenity of the tissue uh, also is lost. Uh, if there is a need for immunohistochemistry or fish or anything to done further to be done further, that will not be possible and uh, there will be erroneous results will be generated. So please remember about the biopsy fragment for sending, especially near the, in the weekends. You should send it as soon as possible and talk to the pathologist and let them process uh, on real time. Always keep the vial uh, with the fixatives and tissue in the room temperature, because if you think to keep the vial in freeze, normal freeze uh, at the weekends, that will also produce ice crystal in the tissue, and that will also hamper the quality of the sections what we cut and our interpretation. So please keep them in room temperature. And it is always a good uh, practice to uh, send the different uh, fragments taken from the different areas of the duodenum or the small bowel in different vials uh, uh, labeled properly. Like this is from the duodenum or the duodenal bulb, this is from the D2 or D3, or if you have a biopsy from the jejunum, please label them separately in separate containers. Why it is so? that I will discuss because please remember the cutoff of IL is different in the duodenum as well as jejunum and the normal shape and architecture of the villi is also different in the duodenum and jejunum. That's how we need to know where from you have taken a biopsy and we also need to know uh, if you have taken a biopsy from the duodenal bulb because we have already uh, told that or discussed that duodenal bulb can be very important uh, in up to 10% cases to see the enteropathic or pathological changes. Also, please remember if the serology is not high, uh, all the biopsy fragments are showing normal pathology. However, in duodenum, we are seeing increased IELs and there is some neutrophils, some eosinophils, and the pathologist may erroneously report that as a changes of uh, pulp localized celiac disease, but uh, the pathologist should know that if it is from the bulb, they have to keep in mind there can be chemical duodenitis because due to the leakage of the gastric juice, there can be some always inflammatory cell infiltrate in this area. That's why pathologists need this information and you have to label them separately. Now we'll come to the histology proper. This is how the different uh, part of the small bubble looks like. This is in very low power. Uh, what is the villi? Villi are finger-like projections that projects inside the bowel lumen. So if this is the bowel, so all these villi-like project, finger-like projections are actually villi. And what are crypts? You can see just below the villi, there are multiple gland-like structures. In all these images, you can see all these gland-like structures are called the crypts. And normal ratio of the villi to crypt is about three to five is to one. And in Asian countries, especially in the tropical countries, we always see a ratio nearly about uh, one is to three. That means uh, the, the villi are three times taller than the crypts. Is there is in difference in shape and size of the villi in the different part of the small bowel? Yes. Normally, all over the world, it is said that the duodenum villi, they look like more like leaf, the jejunal villi are the tallest and they look like tongue, okay? And the, uh, uh, and the ileal villi, they are more like, or the jejunal villi, they are more like fingers. So, so they are finger shaped. But in Asian countries, we see more of the duodenal villi are of finger shaped. So please remember the villi looks like fingers and the, their shape can differ in the different part of the small bowel. The jejunal villi is the tallest and their shape is like our tongue. And most in tropical countries, though we see finger-like uh, villi, they can be also leaf-like. And in duodenum, we also see uh, adhered villus tip very commonly. And this is the uh, ileal villi which are usually finger shaped. And if we go from here to deeper uh, to the distal most part of the small bowel, we'll gradually see more number of goblet cells. Here the goblet cell number are very less. Roughly the ratio of the absorptive cells and goblet cell is about one is to 10. So this is the goblet cell, this punched out space, this is filled with mucin. And all these cells, which are tall columnar, but have eosinophilic cytoplasm, these are all absorptive cells. So in the duodenum, the ratio is about 10 is to one. But as we go down into the ileum, the num number of the goblet cell also increases. How can we also identify the duodenum more? 
the in the just below the duodenal mucosa we see this pale mucus mucin secreting gland these are called brunner gland so pathologists can also understand that uh, these are this biopsy has been taken from the duodenum and also for the gastroenterologist budding gastroenterologist please, please remember that mucosa starts from here and the mucosa ends at the muscularis mucosi. Can you see this uh, thin layer of muscle? So the whole part is the muscularis mucosi, and below that we see submucosa. So now we have come to the poll question. Uh, this is the answer of the poll question three. I think it is well explained now why we should use ten percent neutral buffered formalin. The percentage. Yes. Yes, can sir. I go back to your slide? I think there was a bit of confusion. Can you explain yes. again what is finger like? And I mean, just can again that one. Okay, so finger like means uh, see, uh, please see the uh, shape. Okay, it just looks like our finger, it is more like conical shape. And in the jejunum, there, uh, the tip of the villa is more like tapered. Okay, that's why it has been compared with the leaf. And here, uh, they, uh, they, they are more compared with the tongue. However, in the duodenum, uh, it is said that they are more like leaf. Okay, uh, but commonly we see finger like uh, villi only in the duodenum, uh, as we see commonly in the ileum also. So you can remember that the duodenal villi are finger shaped, ileal villi are finger shaped, they are more of conical shape. And see in the jejunum, the villi tip, they're converging. Okay, so that's why they have been compared with a shape of a, our tongue. So this is the only difference, but there, there can be some exception also. And also please see that if this is the uh, villi, there is a uh, dark eosinophilic layer here on the top, okay? What is this? This is actually microvilli. So to increase the absorptive surface, we don't, uh, we not only have this villi-like projection, we also have multiple microvilli, and this is the electron microscopic structure uh, picture. You can see this is the villi, this is the mucosal surface, and on the top of that, there are multiple thin, again, villi-like projections. They are called microvilli. The basic uh, purpose of all this villi-like villi structure and microvilli-like structure is that to increase the absorptive surface. So is there is any more question here? Okay, so we'll go ahead. So now the most important thing along with the proper orientation and mounting is to send a properly filled out requisition form. And please remember to mention the demography as well as history of the recent travel if there is any, because uh, that helps the pathologist to correlate the pathological changes. The brief clinical history uh, uh, mentioning about the endoscopic indications. If there is serology done, please mention what is the uh, serology titer and what is your uh, lab cutoff used. Mm, what is the type of the diarrhea? It is profuse diarrhea or it is very uh, scant amount of the diarrhea or bloody diarrhea that you may mention. That will help the pathologist to understand the uh, uh, pathology better. And also most importantly, many times uh, uh, we forget to mention on the requisition form history regarding the medications. Please remember to mention if the patient is taking NSAIDs for a uh, prolonged time or antihypertensive like angiotensin type 2 receptor blockers or proton pump inhibitors. Uh, if the patient is taking many chemotherapeutic medications or anti pdl one uh, inhibitors, uh, please also please know that all these medications can produce a change just like the changes we see in celiac disease. Uh, uh, how, how long they should be uh, uh, used and after um, uh, 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 what is the time period after which uh, we see, uh, see the pathological changes also varies uh, uh, according to the drugs like angiotensin type 2 uh, blockers, they usually produce the pathological changes after they are being used for four to six months or so. And instead, they produces the pathological changes relatively uh, uh, quickly. Uh, after seven days only, we can see increased IELs and so. So you please remember how long the patient is taking the medications and which medication they are taking. If the patient is already a diagnosed case of celiac disease and on follow-up, please mention if the patient is already on gluten-free diet or not. If it also helps to uh, 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 
word our interpretation accordingly and clinicians contact number should always be given on the contact form uh, because uh, or the requisition form it helps the pathologist to discuss if there is any confusion so it is if you can see these are the common small bowel pathologies what we commonly encounter uh, especially in north india and many part other parts of the country like celiac disease tropical flu infectious etiology is very common uh, very rarely uh, we can see whipple's disease abital hyperproteinemia GRDSs, if seed CVID and autoimmune enteropathy, rarely we can encounter. Please see, in all of them, we need multiple number of biopsy fragments as we have discussed. And for all of them, please include at least four biopsy fragments from D2 or D3, and at least one biopsy fragment from the duodenal bulb, because all of them can show very patchy pathological changes. The protocol of fixation is almost same for them. So please remember, if you follow a single protocol, that will suffice. But why you need to mention all your clinical interpretation and the type of the diarrhea and what medications patient is taking, uh, for how long the patient is having the symptoms, if there is any lymph node or not, that will help the pathologist to decide uh, if the pathological changes uh, are particular to a disease or not, uh, and also to decide if any further investigations have to be done on the biopsy fragment or not. For example, if we are considering a Whipple's disease where we are supposed to see uh, eosinophilic foamy macrophages, then uh, one biopsy fragment, if you seen, uh, send in glutaraldehyde solution, the pathologist can uh, do the electron microscopy and confirm the diagnosis. In case of IPSID, suspected IPSID, if you send a serum sample, then electrophoresis can be done and immunofixation will tell if the immunoglobulins are uh, uh, normal type or they are uh, uh, no abnormal type. Okay. Uh, also, it is very important if you have IPSID, diagnosis of IPSID in mind, always mention what is the ICRM IGA level that will help the pathologist to correlate the pathological finding. If you are thinking if the patient can have abital hyperproteinemia, in that case, we need to see the fat vacuoles in the epithelium. And the fat vacuoles are usually washed out if you send only the biopsy fragments on form formalin. In that case, you have to send at least one to two biopsy fragments on aluminum foil, uh, keeping uh, uh, that foil on ice as soon as possible possible that should be sent to the pathology lab, frozen sectioning should be done, and we can do oil dose staining to see if there is any fat vacuoles in the epithelium or not. And this oil dose staining cannot be done on formalin fixed tissue. That's why you need at least one biopsy fragment for frozen section examination. So this is a snapshot how to um, uh, take the biopsy fragments and what is the need of you know, giving information to the pathologist. Now we have come to the biopsy handling and processing part. After we have taken this or got this uh, mounted uh, biopsy fragments mounted on the filter paper, multiple fragments on, uh, sing, uh, separately mounted on the filter papers, pathologist, at least in our center, what we do, we put a, a very uh, diluted eosin uh, stain on them uh, to see if the mucosa is act actually uh, uh, situated on the top or towards our face so that uh, we can send that or pass on the fragments to our um, uh, uh, technicians for further processing. What our resident do, they put all these biopsy fragments or all these filter paper mounted fragments on a larger, um, uh, uh, larger fragment or larger piece of filter paper. They fold it just like an envelope and put it in a cassette. And are now it is up to the, our technician. The technicians also are aware that you have mounted the biopsy fragments, keeping the mucosa on the top. So what do they do before making the um, paraffin wax block, what they do, they rotate the biopsy fragment 90 degree so that all the layers means mucosa as well as submucosa come into the cutting plane. Now the wax is poured and that is uh, solidified and a biopsy and a paraffin block is prepared. And after that, they take multiple sections. Uh, all our technicians know who handle small biopsy, small intestinal biopsies, they know that at least five to 10 say, uh, step sections should be given. And our protocol is to take uh, to keep the first step sections towards the level of the slide so that we know in which sequence the biopsy step sections has been taken. Sometimes we need to take maybe up to 20 to 30 or maybe more than that step sections to get a very well-oriented well biopsy fragments.
Now we have come to the full question four. Now, how the orientation of the biopsy fragments can be improved? So what you understood till now, only by filter paper mounting, B is filter paper mounting, training the residents and technicians and examining multiple step sections. Option C is training the residents and technicians regarding the biopsy orientation. And option D is examining multiple step sections only. So we'll wait for your answers. So uh, it is very satisfying to see that you are with me and uh, you have understood the subject very clearly. So the answer is correct. Uh, almost 95% said that uh, the biopsy orientation can be improved by filter paper mounting. The training the residents to check if the mucosa is uh, actually situated on the top and technique uh, uh, in, and uh, 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 also training our technicians how to actually handle and turn around the biopsy fragments and take multiple step sections so that we get absolutely oriented biopsy fragments during our interpretation. So the correct answer is B. You are absolutely right. So we'll go ahead. So now we'll come to the part that how the biopsy uh, assessment uh, orient, uh, oriented uh, orientation of the biopsy orientation is actually checked under the microscope. See, there are four scenarios I have given. So what you have, what you are seeing here, all the creeps are situated longitudinally on the muscularis mucosae, and all the villi are uh, well aligned here. Here, what is happening? Uh, all the creeps are longitudinally situated on the muscularis mucosae. However, only one villi is aligned and Less, uh, rest of them are leaned backwards. Here, all the villi are aligned, but all the creeps are not aligned and they are cut roundly. If, uh, uh, if we see round, roundly cut creeps, that means uh, but the villi are, the creeps are not at all oriented. And here in this scenario, neither the creeps are oriented, neither the villi are oriented. So uh, the, the actual definition of the biopsy orientation is uh, where we'll say the biopsy is oriented if at least three to four creeps yeah, are in a row are situated perpendicularly over the muscularis mucosae, as well as the overlying villi are aligned properly like this. So in actual scenario, this is the ideal and this is the aligned segment. What you can identify, all the creeps are perpendicularly situated here and the villi are well aligned. Here, what is, uh, we'll call this limited because though the creeps are longitudinally situated, the villi, they are leaned backwards. Here, see in this, this is also limited because only one villi is aligned and the creeps are also longitudinal. But see this, this is uh, leaned backwards so that it is looking like this part of the mucosa is completely flattened. So that is not so. So most of the, uh, so if the pathologists don't uh, heed attention to the orientation properly, they will interpret this area as three uh, marsh modified mass 3C changes. And see this part of the uh, biopsy fragment is not at all oriented, the villi are not aligned and all the creeps are round, so will not interpret in such a fragment. Also, we have to remember that if the biopsy fragments are taken over Brunner's gland or a large lymphoid follicle, or if erroneously you have uh, mounted the biopsy fragments, keeping the mucosa towards the uh, uh, to a down, so there will be artificial effacement of the mucosa, and there can be erroneously the pathologist can interpret this is 3C changes. So interpretation in all these areas should be avoided. So this is our answer of the poll question we have already discussed. Now we have come to the poll question five where and how the IL should be counted in the mucosa. Option A is tip of the villi. Option B is upper one third of the villi starting from the villus tip. Option C is all over the mucosal epithelium, you can count the IELs. And option D is upper one third of the villi starting from the villa tip and at least in five well oriented villa tip should be, IL should be counted. So what should be the answer?
So that's excellent. Again, most of the participants have said that the correct answer should be D. Yes, it should be counted on the upper one third of the villi and how it is counted, I will show you in the next slide. So this is how the IELs are counted. So first we identify well-oriented villi like this uh, and then we identify which is the villa steep and we start from the middle point or the apex of the villi and we count the epithelial cells as well as the IUL on the both sides. We come down on the both sides and we do the, that uh, in five more in um, oriented villa steep and then we gave an average count of intraepithelial lymphocytes per 100 ep uh, epithelial cells. When we should use immunohistochemistry like CD3 stain or CD8 stain, it is not routinely recommended. Please remember that you, the IHC uh, the recommendation of IHC is very restricted. You can do it or the pathologist can do it if there is high uh, anti-TTG antibody titer in the patient's serum, but microscopic examination showed a marsh zero lesion or the, and also sometimes the, uh, we get the borderline high IEL. Borderline high IEL means the IEL count is between 25 to 29 per 100 epithelial cells. And as you know, if it is more than 30, we say it is pathological. So this borderline IELs, if you see, so sometimes the pathologist can do the CD3 or CD8 stain to highlight the IELs better and recount. Also, uh, IHC stain can be done in suspected cases of uh, uh, if there is a refractory celiac disease and also for immunophenotyping of the IELs because we need to see if the intraepithelial lymphocytes are showing any aberrant phenotype or not to classify between the type 1 and type 2 refractory celiac disease. So in routine purpose, for routine purpose, there is no indication for doing uh, IHC stain for IEL counting and it can be very well done on HNE stain slides. And also, I uh, mentioned you to please separately label the biopsy fragments on the duodenum and jejunum, why it is so. Because see, if the pathologists don't know, um, the, the cutoffs are different. In duodenum, we use a pathological cutoff of 30 per 100 epithelial cells. In the jejunum, we use a cutoff of 40 uh, per 100 epithelial cells. So if you mix them up, we can erroneously say that patient is having March 1 changes or celiac changes of enteropathy. So please heed attention to that. So this is how the counting is done in actual scenario. We have identified the uh, tip of the villi. And now uh, these are the IELs. IELs are round and this is, these are very dark, least stained structures because the chromatin is very dense. And we usually see a clear halo around them and all other cigar shaped structure which are lightly stained, they are epithelial cells. So we count how many uh, IELs are there and how many epithelial cells are there. And we do that in five more oriented villa steep and then we give an average count. So this is how we actually do. We identify the IELs and we count the uh, epithelial nuclei also. And then we give a average count. Now, this is the answer. You have correctly said it should be done in the upper the one third of the villi starting from the villa steep and at least five oriented villi steep, villa steep, it should be counted. And also please remember, uh, if the biopsy fragment is not oriented and pathologist has, because I showed this picture earlier, this is a limited biopsy. Why? This is a well aligned villi. The creeps are very longitudinally situated and oriented. However, this is leaned backwards. So please remember in the basal part of the villi, IL counts are usually more. Okay, so if your pathologist think that the mucosa is flattened here and count the IELs here, so actually he's uh, counting the IELs in the basal part of the villi only. And this will give an erroneous pathological report. That's why orientation is a job uh, or responsibility by both the gastroenterologist in the endoscopy room for mounting, as well as the pathologist and well expert technicians. So it is very important for the small biopsy interpretation. This is how the crypt hyperplasia looks like. Hyperplasia, whenever there is hyperplasia, we'll see crypt branching like this. There will be tortuosity and the color will be more basophilic. Okay, and uh, how many crypt villas axis should be counted? Uh, uh, any any number of crypt villas axis uh, can be assessed for the crypt to villas ratio assessment. However, at least 
five to uh, six or four to five uh, crypt villas access if you can um, uh, find out uh, they are well oriented and you can uh, assess the crypt villas ratio that will be optimum so this is actually a demonstration how the crypt villas ratio is uh, interpreted so this is first we'll see if the biopsy is oriented or not the criteria i think you remember the crypt should be perpendicularly oriented on the muscularis mucosi so this part will think that this is oriented now we'll identify the shoulder of the biopsy. Shoulder means this is the junction of the villi as well as the crypt. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the imaginary line. This is the shoulder of the biopsy, and now we'll see the distance from here to the tip of the villi and from to the deepest mode past of the uh, crypts. So this will be the crypt villus ratio, where it seems that crypt villus ratio is almost one is to one. So we'll give a modified March grade of three B. This is how we estimate the crypt villus ratio. And also, uh, before we get to histological grading, how the grading is done, I think all of you know how the pathological sequences takes place. Uh, whenever there, the patient becomes sensitized to gluten, there is increased IELs, how the IELs come here in the tip of the villi, because they have homing receptors there. The receptors are e catherine and CCL25. And uh, because uh, all our IELs, they have these uh, receptors on their surface, CD103 and CCR9, that's why they have their specific receptors there, that's why they home there. So whenever there is increased apoptosis in this zone due to glucin sensitized IELs, what happens? There is loss of the enterocytes here. Whenever there is loss of enterocytes, as you know, the at the base of the crypt, there is a intestinal stem cell niche. So there is increased proliferation of the basal cells from here, and they now mature and goes and replenish the uh, uh, lost cells here in the tip of the villi. So this is our images, just to show there is increased positivity of the LDR5 cells in the celiac disease in comparison to the normal. So if the patient uh, keep on taking more and more gluten, uh, at last, what happens? This regenerative mechanism fails. So there is a uh, phenomenon of creep failure and the villi gradually becomes shortened. So this is how we the pathological changes take, takes place. So before we go to the actual grading system, this is the poll number question six for you. Is the histological grading in small intestinal mucosal biopsy is essential or necessary? The answers are options are A, not necessary, B, help in deciding management, C, help it to assess the response to GFD, and D, both B and C are correct. So we'll wait for your answer. Again, most of the participant has said that both B and C are correct. And yes, that is actually the correct answer. And we'll explain that. So this is how the histological grading are done, is done in small intestinal biopsies. And there are various grading system which are available. As you know, the original mass classification and that was modified in 1992 by the Overhoover. This is the modified uh, classification uh, that was followed by in 2000 by Kodas and Vilanchi classification and in 2005 uh, NSARI classification. And this is Q histological classification proposed by us in 2019. So please see what is the difference between all these two. There is very minimal changes between the March grade one and March grade two. So what are the where the changes lies in the, especially in March classification and over modified March classification? The, uh, the main difference is here. In modified March classification, uh, uh, mild, moderate, and severe villus abnormality subclassification uh, was not done. However, Overward said that uh, or subclassified the villus abnormality as mild, moderate, and severe villus abnormality. Please remember that. Uh, all these criteria, all these terminologies are very qualitative. So uh, it may be different between you and me, what is a mild or moderate villus abnormality. That's why there is a uh, huge inter-observer variations while applying the modified Marsh grading system. 
Originally, Mars classification, the original cutoff, pathological cutoff in intraepithelial lymphocytes were more than or equal to 40 per 100 epithelial cells, but that was modified subsequently. In 2005, it was said that the cutoff should be 30 per 100 epithelial cell, and in 2017, the cutoff was said to be 27 per 100 epithelial cells. Now we know that all over world, um, the, the cutoff is being considered is more than or equal to 25 per 100 epithelial cells. So also you may remember that uh, we see increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, crypt hyperplasia, and then we assess the crypt height and the uh, crypt depth and the villa site, and we give a ratio. However, it was failed that uh, the crypt hyperplasia is very non-specific, and in the classifications which came later, including ours, uh, this was not a considered was uh, a criteria. Okay, so this is the main difference, and this is how the classification uh, uh, is done. And also, why there was a need of Q-histological classification? Because I told you, all these classifications have had uh, qualitative criteria. They never said how much villous abnormality should be there that should be uh, graded as mild or moderate. However, qualitative in quantitative classification, we have a quantitative criteria. That's why the inter-observer variation is also less. There is another histological uh, slightly modified classification, what we described that. So Marsh one will be when we see normal one is to three ratio and there is only increased IELs here. In Marsh two, there will be in addition crypt hyperplasia and there will be increased IELs, but the ratio will be maintained. In Mars 3a, we said that the ratio would be less than one is to three, but it will be more than one is to one. Okay, so that will be Mars 3a. In Mars 3b, the villas height and the creep depth will be almost equal. So the ratio will be one is to one. And Mars 3c changes we should only use when the creep depth is more than the villa site. So this is how we slightly modified the classification and it works very well. And as I said, there is a very wide intra-observer and inter-observer uh, disagreements while using these qualitative criteria. You can see the disagreements is up to in half, uh, half of the cases, means up to 50%. However, if you use the quantitative criteria, the uh, disagreements is very less uh, and the agreements reaches up to 72%. So this is the correct answer. You have very correctly said. So before we go to histological features, very quickly, I will show some histological features in some specific pathologies. Do you have any specific question? Or the chairpersons can uh, just read out all those questions if they have. I think we have we a have couple of questions. Uh, one question is, uh, how can we differentiate celiac disease and tropical espro histologically? That will come to the next uh, section. Okay. okay. Then, then there is one more question. Uh, Dr. Deepika is asking how to differentiate certain villi from backward orientation. See, that comes from an experience. I would say mm. we uh, mainly depend on, see, the, I uh, told you this is a well aligned villi and this is uh, backward, this is a leaned villi, which is leaned backwards, okay? We see this typical shape. Uh, uh, this typical orientation tell us that it is not actually flattened. This is uh, leaned backwards, okay? So I cannot uh, tell you how it works uh, on uh, under the microscope, but this comes from experience, I would say. Any other question, sir? No, that much only. Okay, so then we can go to the... <laughs> yes, just, yes, just sir. Just everyone. Okay, there is one basic, more. Uh, okay. Very basic, very basic in this, mm -hmm. that uh, Mars 0 yes. is normal biopsy. Yes. Mars 1, it means there's increased IEL counts. IELs. More than 25. The Mars 2, there's increased IEL counts along with there's a crypt hyperplasia. Exactly. And then Mars 3, when the, again, uh, IELs more than 25, there's a crypt and there's a ratio of uh, abnormal ratio. So yes. normal ratio is one is to three. So here 3A will be less than one is to three. Two, three, three B will be one is to one ratio and three C will be crypts are longer or the depth is, crypt depth is uh, more than the crypt. More than the villa site. Yes, yes. Right. And so normal ratio is uh, 
one is to three, one is to three to one is to five. Normally, one is to five, but we don't see one is to five very commonly because right. of our ethnicity, we commonly see one is to three to one is to four. Right, right. So we have a couple of more questions coming up. I can we can take up here. Uh, okay. What are the differential diagnosis for increased uh, duodenal IEL? So that we'll discuss again. Okay. What is In the, the uh, intraepithelial uh, lymphocytosis? Initially, it was 25 to 29 IEL uh, per thousand uh, enterocytes. And uh, what is uh, the current status? See, we still are using in our practice the cutoff which was given in the modified mars that is 30 per 100 intraepithelial cells okay so if it is more than that or equal to that 30 will take it as pathological however recently if you look at all the literatures which are coming up globally as well as in our independent study also we have seen that if the pathological cutoff is uh, the cutoff has come down uh, if it is more than or equal to 25 per 100 epithelial cells you can take it as uh, uh, pathological changes but you have to also keep in mind that we uh, uh, live in a country where the upper GI infections are very common so there will be always some intraepithelial lymphocytosis so we we should be very careful not to over diagnose uh, an enteropathy or celiac disease and uh, we should rationalize our interpretation and we should discuss uh, in a mdt meeting dr ramakrishna any question no, no, there weren't any questions i think there's a lot of a lot of questions in the chat box but i think many of them are being answered along the way by presenting okay so, then i think we can go ahead yeah so we'll go ahead with a, again a poll question. Are histological changes in the small bowel pathology specific? A is yes, B is no, C some features are specific, D some features are not specific. So we'll discuss this in the subsequent slides. We'll uh, wait for your answer here. So the most common answer or most commonly answered option is the option C. You thought that some features are specific. Uh, we'll answer that in the subsequent slides. So we'll go ahead here. So I'll skip this. All of you know for, uh, what is the endoscopic feature in celiac disease. We have started with the celiac disease. So I have already described all the features of enteropathy and in a uh, established celiac disease or advanced celiac disease, what we see, we see a lot of hyperplastic creeps. We see increased inflammatory cell infiltrate in the mucosa. We see increased uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes on the surface epithelium. And here, all of you can identify that there is no villi like projections or no finger like projections on the mucosal surface. That means that uh, this. Part, this is oriented, we have seen, this part of the mucosa has completely flattened. So if all the features matches, we'll say, and we know the serological features, we'll say that or label that is compatible with celiac disease and modified MARS 3C changes. Here also we can see that the tall, tortuous scripts and the mucosa is completely flattened and there is increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. I have shown you how to count them. So all of them are showing pathological changes which may be compatible with the clinical suspicion of celiac disease. But please remember, all of these features can be seen in all small intestinal pathologies, what we commonly see, like in tropical sprue, upper GI infection, parasitic infestations, and medicine-induced enteritis or medication-induced enteritis. I will show you some of the examples. These are biopsy images from our patients of tropical sprue. See, all the features what I have just described in celiac disease, they are also present here. We are seeing tortuous branching creeps. We are seeing a lot of inflammatory cell infiltrate. There is also increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, and there is some villus flattening or some shortening. If you, if this is a shoulder, you can measure from here to here and here to here. At least if it is not one is to one, it will be one is to two at least. So there is mild villus flattening. There is some megaloblastic change, but in a practical 
case that will not help us to make a diagnosis of uh, tropical flu. So what is important, I insisted on uh, mentioning, uh, you should mention always the medication history as well as history of travel and what is the type of the diarrhea. If you uh, mention that there is a uh, history of travel to the endemic zone, or especially if the patient is from South India, we will think that the patient is having uh, uh, a tropical flu. So we did a, a systematic review uh, to see the basic differences between the tropical flu and the celiac disease. Like, uh, just like the endoscopic finding, what we found that if we have roughly 100 patients of celiac disease and 100 biopsies from tropical flu patients, severe villus abnormality, that means MARS 3B and MARS 3C changes will be much more common in patients with celiac disease. And mild villus abnormality or normal villi are more commonly seen in patients of tropical flu. So this is one difference, but that may not help in uh, a practical scenario when we have to, for a particular patient, we have to decide if it is tropical flu or celiac disease. Then there is some difference of the ileolosis, the pattern of increased IELs. I have already told you where to identify the IELs and the villus tip, upper one third. However, in some patients of the tropical flu, we see a decrescendo pattern and the villi, the IELs are more increased in the base of the villi and the side of the villi. In the epithelium, I'll show you how it looks like, but that is not for all biopsies. And if you count, uh, look at the eosinophilic cell infiltrate, it has been seen that eosinophils can be seen in both celiac disease and tropical flu. However, if we uh, count the number in tropical flu, uh, eosinophilic infiltration, the number is more higher, 14 versus 26. So this is how the uh, so this is the tip of the villi. So if you restrict our interpretation or counting here in all the oriented villi, we'll say the mucosa doesn't have any uh, enteropathy. However, see just uh, in the middle part and the base of the villi, there are uh, so many increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. So that will not tell us that this is a patient of tropical flu, but will raise a, um, a, a question and we can discuss with our uh, uh, gastroenterology colleague to uh, think if it is a tropic, can be a tropical flu or not. So this pattern we say a decreasing type of ileolosis. And also, as I said, eosinophils, the count will be much more higher in tropical flu. However, eosinophils can also be seen in celiac disease. Eosinophils can also be seen in various parasitic infestations, as this is an example of strongyloidis infection in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis under steroid for long period. You can see there are so many eosinophils in the mucosa. So eosinophils, you know, eosinophilic infiltration is also not specific to any disease. However, they may help uh, with the background clinical history and the, uh, the background information. And also, if we rule out all other histological abnormality features or possibilities, we can raise if there are too many eosinophils and the eosinophils are causing infiltration or infiltrating the creeps and causing eosinophilic cryptitis, we may raise a question that if it can be an eosinophilic enteritis. Please remember eosinophilic enteritis is a diagnosis of exclusion. Pathologist alone cannot make a diagnosis of eosinophilic enter enteritis, but they can raise a question and you need to correlate with the absolute eosinophil counts, tool findings, and all other uh, features. And what is the pathological cutoff that is also controversial, but uh, more commonly we use a cutoff of 20 eosinophils per high power field. High power field means under 140x uh, objective field. Okay, So if the number is more than 20, but that, that, that is always pathological. However, if even if they are uh, lesser in number, but they are causing uh, eosinophilic cryptitis and destroying the creep, that may be also pathologically significant. Also, please remember that eosinophil is also an important component, inflammatory cell component in inflammatory bowel disease. In inflammatory bowel disease, we commonly see basal plasma cytosis because the crypts become shorter. These are the branching crypts. So there is a lot of plasma cell infiltrated in the deeper part of the mucosa that is called basal plasma cytosis. In addition, we see a lot of neutrophilic and eosinophilic cell infiltrate in the mucosa along with all other features. So this is an example of small bowel Crohn's disease where you can see 
the inflammatory cell infiltrate is so patchy. Here, the inflammation is dense. The mucosa has completely flattened here. However, uh, in, the, the, in the other fragment, uh, the mucosa is tall and there are some lymphoid aggregates though. Here also, we don't see much lymphoid aggregate formation. And here also, inflammatory cell infiltrate is going into the submucosa. So this is how we see in Crohn's disease. So in Crohn's disease also, we can see a lot of neutrophil and eosinophils along with villus abnormality, grid branching and increased IELs. Okay, the all other features can mimic each other. This is an example of small bowel graft versus his disease in a patient who underwent, underwent uh, bone marrow transplant. And here also what we are seeing, the crypts are being destroyed by lymphocytic infiltrate. So lymphocytic infiltrate, as I said, intraepithelial lymphocytes can be seen in celiac disease, uh, tropical sprue, in all other uh, features, uh, entities, what I have just shown, also in GVHD. And we also see eosinophils, a lot of eosinophils and neutrophils in GVHD. And these are the neutrophils and mitotic bodies. These are the apotrotic bodies. And sometimes the mucosa can also undergo uh, ulceration and necrosis if the GVSD uh, is severe. This is uh, these are some examples from the common variable immunodeficiency or CVID. CVID has multiple various types of histological presentation. One is the most common is the sprue-like presentation. Sprue-like means we can see variable villus flattening, crypt hyperplasia, and increased IELs. So if you don't know, if your pathologist don't know any history, uh, he may say that it is a celiac disease and do the marsh grading. However, this is actually a CVID. Uh, if we go into high power, we'll see there is lack of mature plasma cells here. And if you do the immunoglobulin study, that will be, uh, there will be severe deficiencies. Also, uh, there can be a colitis-like histology, just like IBD, you can see a lot of neutrophilic infiltrated cryptitis, cryptapsis is eosinophil. And also in CVID, sometimes we see a lot of mucosal lymphoid aggregates. So if we see uh, very prominent mucosal lymphoid aggregate in the proximal bowel or the small bowel, that is, we think that is always pathologic that can be due to H. pylori infection or that can be due to CVID and we always go into high power and look for the mature plasma cells that they are or not and we also look into the muco lumen into the lumen or just on the mucosal surface if there is any parasitic infection like GRDSs. So all these also all these combinations can raise a possibility of CVID and pathologists can also sometimes suggest uh, kindly look for the immunoglobin levels and also a difficult diagnosis autoimmune enteropathy where also we can see a lot of inflammation and the inflammation is mixed type. We see a lot of neutrophil plasma cells and lymphocytic infiltrate. IELs can be raised. There can be crypt hyperplasia and villus flattening as you can see in this uh, one example. Though in adults that is uh, less commoner than in children, but it can be seen. And in this case, the specific diagnosis can be established only after a correlation with anti-brush border, uh, serological antibody titer or anti-gablet cell antibody titer. Otherwise, all the other features can mimic each other. And this is one example of Olmi certain associated enteropathy. The histological features, if you don't tell me uh, if the patient is have a, if the serology is high or not, uh, what is the other features? If the patient is having any medic medications or not for how long, I will say the patient is having possibly a celiac disease or tropical flu. So these patients Olmi are usually seronegative, IELs are increased, and this is a delay type of uh, cell mediated immunity and we see villus abnormality due to proapotrotic effect of increased interleukin 15 uh, which is usually seen in patients who are getting old certain for the longer period this is an example of if seed if seed also all other features can mimic each other only exception is the villi are very much broadened and we see sheets of plasma cells uh, however, other features like increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, lymphocytic infiltrate into the creeps, and lymphocytic and plasma cell infiltrate into the uh, lamina propria are, uh, they will mimic each other. Uh, there are various uh, uh, types of IFSEED, type A, type B, and type C. Unless it is type C, type C, we see atypical cell just like a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. However, type A and type B, if we don't know what is the serum immunoglobulin level, uh, 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 your pathologist can think that these are the changes related to celiac disease or some other pathologies and may not suspect it to be uh, uh, if seed. And if seed, this is a lymph node aspirate, and we are also seeing a lot of plasma cell infiltrate into the lymph node. And uh, there is 
no IHC which can uh, uh, mark the cryptic type of IgA. So if you want to establish the diagnosis always and always we need to do electrophoresis and immunophilic fixation to see if the IgA type is cryptic or it is normal type that will establish our diagnosis. So this is the answer uh, to the poll question seven. So histological changes in small bowel disorder are not specific. The uh, correct answer would be B. So what we are identifying, we are identifying the changes of enteropathy. And what are the changes of enteropathy? Just to uh, re-insist, the enteropathy changes are increased IELs, crypt hyperplasia, and or uh, and or villus abnormality and altered crypto villus ratio okay and a specific diagnosis can only be achieved if we correlate the clinical serological endoscopic and histological findings and uh, uh, always multidisciplinary team meetings should be done so we have now come to the poll question eight uh, is there is any laboratory test for diagnosing celiac disease on the tissue? I am asking, talking about the tissue, not serum, IgA, TTG level, okay? So any laboratory test for the diagnosing celiac disease? Your option is A, no. B, it is diagnosis of clinical serological histological correlation only. C, small bile biopsy is diagnostic. And D, demonstration of IgA anti-TTG2 antibody deposit in the tissue may help. So we'll answer for your, uh, we'll wait for your answer. Yes, we have already discussed that the uh, B all, almost B is also correct that we can establish a diagnosis of clinical, serological, and histological uh, by correlating. However, my question was, if there is any new upcoming laboratory test, which can be applied on the tissue, and your next question, next answer, 25% of the attendees have given correct answer. And this is the correct answer. Why? Because we can do a multicolor immunofluorescence uh, microscopy or multicolor immunohistochemical uh, uh, analysis to see if there is any deposition of the circulating IgA TT anti TTG2 type antibody that cannot be done uh, uh, with a single type of IHC, like for IgG anti TTG, which is uh, anyway uh, stain the tissue. Okay, so we need to identify if the IgA type of anti TTG has been deposited in tissue in the small bowel or that can be done also in extraintestinal tissue like in liver uh, in other part of the bowel you can do that and you can establish uh, a correlation with the celiac disease what we are identifying is actually uh, a complex because as you know the ttg enzyme is present in various tissue and ttg causes deamidation of the gliadin peptide as well as it uh, combines and forms a complex while combining with the gliadin peptide and antibody is formed against this and iga anti tt ttg2 that circulates in our body and it cross reacts with the and the ttg enzyme which is present in various tissue that's why we see uh, herpes uh, uh, dermatitis hepatiformis like changes or involvement, systematic involvement of celiac disease. However, these circulating antibody deposits can be identified by the multicolor immunohistochemistry or multicolor immunofluorescent staining, just what I have shown. And this is an upcoming and good uh, test. And it has a sensitivity and specificity nearly about 90%. And uh, it is a good tool to identify uh, any extraintestinal involvement in celiac disease. It can be applied. So I will uh, show you very quickly uh, some examples where the small bowel enteropathies, where the, where the histological examination can give a diagnostic clue. Till now, we have shown that the histological features are quite non-specific and overlapping type. So one example is lymphangiectiasis. All of you know how does it looks like under endoscope. It can be diffuse or it can be uh, for very focal lymphangiectasia. And you see all these milky white spots and the mucosa, and this is 
is how we identify histologically. This is the markedly dilated and uh, vascular spaces lined by endothelial cells and filled with lymphatic spaces. And if there is any obstruction of the lymphatics, we see this type of dilated lymphatics. And what happens after absorption of the fat containing particles cannot be carried uh, to the venous blood. And that's why we see uh, but there is a lot of uh, protein losing type of diarrhea in these patients. This is example two, where histology can be very diagnostic and the pathologist should give attention to these uh, histiocytes. These are histiocytes which have uh, finely granular eosinophilic uh, granules in them. So you can see on high part, these are the histiocytes which have fine granules, eosinophilic granule. And if we do a simple stain, this is the periodic acid sieve stain with diastase. We can see all these granules are uh, being highlighted. So with these two stains only, we can diagnose that this is a case of Whipple's disease. And all these are actually bacterial product and the bacteria is the trophy and we see that commonly in Whipple's disease, and this is in one of our patients, we did electron microscopy and identified this type of bacilli inside the macrophages. And uh, there is a lot due to infiltration of a lot of these macrophages, the basolateral transport into the blood vessels and into the lymphatic are suffered and the patient presents with diarrhea and malabsorption. This is example three where the diagnosis can be, uh, 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 the histology can be diagnostic provided you have a clinical suspicion of abital hyperproteinemia and you have sent at least one biopsy fragment in aluminum foil for doing frozen section. So this is a frozen section images. You can see these are the top of the villi and there are a lot of uh, fatty uh, but droplets on the epithelial cells. All these fat droplets can be highlighted by oil redo stain, which is a fat stain. Now, the problem is if you don't suspect and send the biopsy directly into the formalin, all these fats are actually washed off and oil redo stain doesn't work on formalin fixed tissue. That's why we can uh, we have we need to get the biopsy for frozen sectioning if you have suspicion of abital hyperproteinemia. On the other hand, histological analysis can also identify uh, various parasitic infestation like GRDSs, but the sickle shaped or pear shaped organisms can easily be identified on the mucosal surface, coccidial infection, especially in immunocompromised patients, like this is an example of cryptosporidiasis present on the mucosal surface. These are rounded bodies. These are microsporidiasis, uh, the very small uh, rounded uh, structures which are present inside the epithelium. And this is an example of strongyloides infection, which are present. These are the nematodes which are present inside the Crypts and they are burrowing down into the crypts. This is an example of strongyloides hyperinfection in immunocompromised patients. Also, small bowel biopsy can be diagnostic in case of amebiasis. This is an uh, ileal biopsy, and we see mucosa is ulcerated, and there is a lot of eosinophilic necrosis. And the pathologist, if you see this type of eosinophilic necrosis, always go into hyper and look for this macrophage like structure. These are actually uh, trophozoites of amoeb amoebic trophozoites, and they usually engulf the RBCs, which we call erythrophagocytosis. Erythrophagocytosis is especially seen um, in case of amoebiasis because they obstetronize the RBCs and they engulf the RBCs and it is one of the feature of the invasive property. So this is this uh, we use this property uh, for our diagnostic health and amoebiasis can well be identified on histology. And very quickly, I will show where histology can be diagnostic, especially in case of some enteropathies in neonates. I have discussed the rest of all, and uh, I will show some example of microvillus inclusion disease. This is a disease of uh, profuse diarrhea in case of neonates, as well as there is a congenital tufting enteropathy or epithelial dysplasia. So this is one of our patients where we did not, the patient was having profuse diarrhea, but the ratio of the villi was maintained. When we uh, saw very carefully, see this, I told you on the mucosal surface, there is another you have a dark eosinophilic layer, this indicate microvilli, okay? So this area, microvilli can be identified, but rest of the areas, the microvilli was totally absent. Always please remember the micro, all our protein structures are formed inside the uh, prote uh, uh, proteasomes and 
uh, they are processed in the Golgi bodies and then transported under the surface. So in this case, there is a specific mutation of the Myo5b gene in the 18q long arm of the 18 chromosome. Uh, and that's why the microvilli which are formed here, they cannot be transported under the mucosal surface. So that can be confirmed by various stain pass and diastase stain can also highlight the microvilli because they have glycocalyx. So this is how the normally microvilli can be seen on the mucosal surface. However, in this case, what we are seeing that sharp dark layer is present inside the epithelium, not on the micromucosal surface. Also, we can do immunohistochemical stain, which can highlight the uh, microvilli like villain stain or the CD10 stain. See, in this case, they are not exposed onto the surface. They are all present inside the epithelium. This is how the normally they should be seen as a dark layer on the mucosal surface. However, in this case, they are intraepithelium. That's why this type of disease, this particular entity is called microvillous inclusion disease. And why it is called inclusion disease? Because on high power examination, we see lots of vesicles. And and if we do electron microscopic examination like we have done in this case, you can see within these vesicles, you are seeing abortic microvilli. So this is the confirmatory. And also uh, we can confirm the, or identify the case with this pass with, uh, pass with diastase stain and the CD10 stain as I have shown. So this is an example of microvillous inclusion disease. And this is an example of tufting enteropathy. We have four or five cases still now where the uh, neonate presented with the profuse diarrhea. And this is how the normal epithelium looks like. See, all the talcolaminar epithelium, they have a single basally situated layer of uh, uh, nuclei. And what you are seeing here, the nuclei are situated at different level and they are jumbled up or clumped up at some places. So these are called tuft or tear drops. So this type of tufting means there is epithelial abnormality and this happens due to a particular mutation that is called APCAM mutation or Claudine 7 mutations, all the tight junction abnormalities. So there is no polarity. So as you all know, uh, absorption occurs through the paracellular pathway and intracellular pathway. So if there is abnormality in the junction, so there will be uh, uh, malabsorption and there will be a lot of diarrhea. And not only small bowel, uh, we have also identified and it is also seen in some patients in the colon also. As you can see, there are a lot of tuft in the colon. So this is an example of tufting enteropathy. And we can see some specific feature in the electron microscopy like duplication of the desmosomes. Normally in the paracellular pathway, we see two to three desmosomes. However, in this case, the desmosomes are multiplied because of malorientation of the epithelium. So, and this is how the reporting are done ultimately. As a gastroenterologist, uh, you should understand how it is reported. Uh, a good pathology report should mention how many biopsy fragment was received, if they are separately labeled or not. Uh, uh, then interpretation, if they are separately labeled, interpretation should be done from uh, for uh, differently for the different separately for the different biopsy fragments, like for, uh, separately for D1, separately for D2, or for je jejunum. And all these information should be given in the descriptive terms like IELs, what would be the was the count, crypt hyperplasia was present or not, what is the crypt villus ratio, uh, all other findings like liminal parasites were present or not. All other histological findings, uh, uh, the pathology should look like if they uh, follow this protocol, which I will show the reference where from they can get this reporting protocol. They can just put a uh, uh, tick or cross, and that's why they will not uh, miss any of these points. Like if there is loss of goblets, it's in the surface mucosa. If there is lamina propria fibrosis, if there is thickening of the subepithelial vessel membrane, or if there is dilated mucosa lymphatics, because not only all these important histological features. This will give some specific diagnosis. If they are seeing any lymphoid aggregates, lack of plasma cells, or um, a lot of plasma cells, all this will help to reach to a specific diagnosis. Then final interpretation and modified marsh grading um, uh, should be mentioned, and uh, it should be discussed if there is any discrepancy. And this is how from where you can get all the uh, uh, protocol which was described. This is a project um, very nicely uh, taken up by the ISG and IAPM together, the pathology, our pathology society and the ISG. And we uh, published this joint consensus in 2021. You can get that in Indian Journal of Pathology and Microbiology in January uh, volume, uh, volume. And this is freely downloadable. I will uh, request all of you to download that. Uh, 
so that we don't miss the important points. So I will summarize my presentation by saying that sampling, orientation, and processing and interpretation of small bile biopsy should be done as per recommended protocol only because there are so many things. It looks very simple looking at a small bile biopsy, but if we are uh, wrong at any of these steps, the interpretation will be wrong. Non-standardized procedures, non-orientation and non-uniform reporting protocol results in improper management and high inter-observer disagreements. And I told you the disagreements are at currently up to 50%. Minimum number of small bowel mucosa to sample is five to six. So always sample in multiples. Uh, please include four biopsy fragments from D2 post ampullary part and at least one biopsy fragment from duodenal bulb. One biopsy fragment from any part of the duodenal bulb is suffic sufficient. Mounting the biopsy fragment on filter paper and labeling fragments from different parts of the bowel separately helps pathologists to examine the histological findings on each of the biopsy sites separately because we know how to judge uh, the chemical duodenitis. Um, uh, then uh, also uh, we need to see um, if there is uh, uh, the disease is patchy and also uh, it, it is to mention that I have always mentioned that you can mount the biopsy fragments on filter paper, Wattman filter paper type one uh, filter paper. However, it can be mounted on any color filter, uh, color uh, uh, piece of papers, or it can be milled uh, on citrate, uh, on uh, uh, citrate uh, papers, on resinoid papers, or even some people use uh, vegetable matrices like cucumber, slices of cucumber or slices of potato to mount them. All of them will suffice for the pathologists. So histological changes, as we said and discussed, it is common in many small bowel proximal pathologies. Like, uh, so what we are doing, we are identifying the enteropathies and the diagnosis is basically uh, a combination of clinical endoscopic, serological, and histological correlation. Grading of enteropathy changes on the small bowel biopsy helps in management because GFD, as you all know, is uh, only given if the changes are uh, more than or equal to March grade two. Uh, and it helps to, uh, judge uh, what is the response to the GFD on the follow-up biopsies. Uh, histology can be diagnostic in a few small bowel diseases, like what I have mentioned, especially in inf infections, parasitic infection, lymphangiectasia, abital hyperproteinemia, Whipple's disease. But it is of utmost importance that you mention your clinical possibility and you discuss with your pathologist what else sample will be required along with uh, the formalin fixed tissue to reach to a proper diagnosis. and. Uh, but we cannot deny that mentioning the relevant clinical and serological information helps pathologists to correlate the histological findings and decide on ancillary tests uh, uh, to be put on the biopsy sections uh, uh, to reach to a diagnosis. I have got uh, this uh, question from many conferences what I attended. Many clinicians ask me if, the, if I mention the serology, the pathologist will be uh, uh, biased, but that is not true. Pathologists are seeing entropathy changes, he can correlate and he can give you more valuable information if you mention the serology on the requisition form. So I think that is all from uh, my, uh, my end. And if there are questions, we'll be happy to uh, take them up. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Prasenjit. Uh, I, I think we, we are just running slightly late. Uh, we've had a lot of questions, a lot of the questions you've answered. There are some questions concerning IBD, which I think will be handled in a future session of the ISG masterclasses. So we don't need to take them. Uh, I, I think the lesson for the students is that when you look at small bowel biopsies, first look at it under a low power, look at the villi, look at the crypts, see if they are normal, Look at the cellularity of the lamina propria, which is generally not very cellular. Then, then you look under higher power to see what kind of cells are there, whether they are the patient's own cells or the foreign cells or whatever. And then, then you come to all these things that we've talked, uh, Dr. Prasnish talked about. He's discussed it beautifully. I think there are a lot of, uh, they, they were uh, appreciation for your this thing on the, uh, on, on the chat box. Dr. Saraj, you want to say a few things? Thank you. Uh, no, sir. It's uh, okay. Very, very exhaustive talk. So I think uh, most questions are already answered. And uh, I see very few questions in the chat box. And that too, 
uh, mostly not significant not significant mostly answered already i think one question is there how to improve the yield of uh, biopsy in uh, lymphangiectasia so possibly they want to uh, hear about uh, some immunostaining or any any special technique anything you want you will like to add See, lymphangiectasia diagnosis, if you are seeing milky white spot and pathologists have reported there is no dilated lymphatics, you please talk to the pathologist and request for taking multiple step sections. We have seen that while we take multiple step sections, maybe 20 or 30, those dilated lymphatics, uh, they come up because we uh, step section meanings like in CT, you take multiple, uh, look at the multiple levels. Uh, we have to take a take at them, look at the multiple levels and sometimes uh, that helps only. So immunohistochemistry doesn't helps because if you are seeing a dilated lymphatics, uh, then doing a lymphatic marker like D240 uh, doesn't add anything more. So uh, I think step cut is the only thing what pathologist can do more while you are not seeing any dilated lymphatics. Uh, one important question has come up that is what is the best site of biopsy for diagnosis of GVHD for uh, the people who are working in with different transplant different types of transplant setting this is important and here also we also um, face sometimes face problem that what what should be the best site see uh, the, it, uh, the, uh, the answer can be very complicated but most importantly it is always important to remember we need to uh, sample from different organs like if you are combining one biopsy from liver one from gi tract one from skin identity but the chance of identifying gbsd will be much more and if you talk about the uh, intestine then always one biopsy fragment of the uh, biopsy from the uh, proximal small intestine helps more than the biopsy fragment from the distal most part. One very direct question I'm, that uh, if endoscopist, what will you advise endoscopist? If endoscopically the mucosa appears normal and the, uh, the clinician is suspecting GVHD, you still recommend uh, taking biopsies from the, those areas, upper GI or lower GI? I think so because uh, see there are different grades of grab versus host disease. In the initial GVHD means type 1 GVHD, we can see only a few apoptotic body and one or two involved creeps. So I think if you have a strong suspicion and all other clinical features are like GVHD, you should uh, go, uh, you, sh you should take biopsy from normal looking mucosa also. So lots of questions related to TB versus Crohn's type of thing. Uh, I think that is a topic in itself. Uh, so that uh, so we will have a, uh, next week, next two weeks later, we'll discuss that hmm. with the Kana hmm. So I think we had a great session and uh, very phenomenal lecture and very, very exhaustive lecture. And uh, this, uh, anybody who has attended this one should uh, suffice for, uh, I think, several years uh, for on GI histopathology for clinicians, I am telling, for pathologists, is not difficult. Thank you so much, Krishna, sir. sir. Anything from your side? No, no, no. I, that's it. I think you have said it all. Hmm. Over to Dr. Govind. So I think uh, uh, Dr. Uh, moderation on this thing, uh, this session. I think this went wonderful. Prasenjit, this went uh, wonderful. I think you made all the important points, uh, describe the uh, how to take biopsy, how many biopsies, and, and how to send biopsies to lab. One of the important point I want to highlight along with Dr. Ramakrishna and uh, Dr. Sinha, that giving information to pathologist and radiologist about clinical scenario is of utmost importance because they can they can see the interpret the radiology and pathology in the clinical setting. We know nothing, except a few the uh, person you saw today, that some are specific. But at many places, they're not specific. They have to be interpreted along with the clinical scenario and also along with the other diagnostic tests. So that's a very important that we must provide uh, enough uh, clinical data to pathologists for a better reporting. And whenever you fail to get a, a appropriate diagnosis, then good to call or phone the pathologist or radiologist and talk to them. Okay, these are my, our clinical suspicions. Uh, will you please help? Because this is a two-way talk always helps. And this is how we know, and Dr. Ramakrishna and uh, Prasenjit, so we have a 
uh, radio conferences and uh, pathology conferences, and we discuss. Uh, we have seen many times uh, that uh, what have been reported on pathology or radiology report, they're totally different once we discuss one-to-one -one and uh, you resolve the diagnosis. So I think you made a point very clear that talking with uh, uh, pathologists and radiologists is uh, very, very important. And lastly, that you described uh, how to interpret uh, a decrypt in villus architecture or abnormality. You described what Mars grading, Mars zero, Mars one, two, and three. Just to summarize once more, because this is, I thought this is one of the most important takeaway. That if IELs are more than 25, uh, they are supposed to be abnormal. But in our country, we think 30 is a cutoff value per 100 epithelial cells. Then Mars one is there's increased IELs, but normal cryptophilus ratio. Mars two is increased IELs but uh, the crypt hypertrophy is there. Mars three is divided into Mars three and three B and three C. So all of them will have increased IELs along with in three A, the cryptophilus ratio will decrease uh, from normal one to three to one to two. Then in Mars three B, it will be one is to one and Mars three C, the crypt depth is more than the, the villus height. And, and many of these things will reverse uh, after you treat them. Because one of the important thing about small intestine, that the small intestinal mucosa is a regenerative. It's not like uh, liver pathologies with uh, fibros, that lead the fibrosis after inflammation. But in small intestine, there's no fibrosis, especially once you're talking about mucosa. So on treatment, the most of the, the changes will bring back. So with that, uh, uh, thank you so very much, Prasenjit and Dr. Sinha and Dr. Ramakrishna for a wonderful series. And thank you everyone for joining in for this masterclass. Uh, it's always a joy to see all of you joining and learn from each other. Uh, thank you, Tech Team. Thank you, Nisa. And have a great day ahead. Before we close, uh, let me invite you for one other masterclass on 12th of June, the same time, 11.30 on Sunday, 12th June, we'll be talk about uh, how to interpret uh, the large intestinal biopsies the biopsies of uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and how to differentiate Crohn's and tuberculosis will be dealt by none other than the Anapoli mood from CM Sevalor. And you know, uh, C is the authority, not only in our country, but worldwide authority on biopsies of uh, IBD and tuberculosis. And she has published uh, multiple important papers which are quoted all over. So don't miss to listen to her on 12th of the two weeks uh, from now. And we have bit, we'll keep all these uh, master classes on IC website. You can visit at any point of time. With that, uh, thank you very much and have a great day ahead. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.